I was accused of having a midlife crisis. I, I did see a psychiatrist and she goes, no, you are having a crisis and you are in your midlife, but this is no midlife crisis. My starting principle foundation is be happy, execute fully, and you will achieve your greatest success to the extent the world allows you to. But if you're capable, you're always capable and you only grow. It's not just the love that she gave to me. And I, I thank her for loving me. It's I actually love myself for the very first time. Today's guest is an entrepreneur who has faced the classic rags to riches, uh, but then to rags again story when he lost everything that he worked so hard to build. And like the classics hero journey, this man found in his darkest time, his truth. And from that truth, He's been able to find connection, love, acceptance, and along the way, he rebuilt his wealth. You have to hear this story. So please help me welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, David M.M. Taffet. So the place I want to start with is 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 you uh, are actually one of one of my clients. Like we've had the opportunity to work together on on a really amazing project uh, over the last year. But but what I didn't know until after we had the chance to work together is just how um, I don't know if intricate's the right word, but just just your entrepreneurial path, your business path, your journey has taken you through like up up ups and like down down downs. And I found your story honestly, like really, really inspiring. So just to help set the scene for everything, help share, how do you describe your background, where you came from? Because you've been in a lot of different industries. You've done a lot of different things. You know, a lot of people start their stories with what they've done professionally. And they generally like to start at the points that make them sound the best and <laughs> highlight their accomplishments. And I actually always start mine with the pain points that drove me to achieve and explain how those same pain points kept me humble when I succeeded and allowed me to survive the things when I failed. And I've had some really nice successes and I've had some spectacular failures. And it all really began with death and a paper route. And the way I look at my life is I've heard this statement about entrepreneurs that the really good ones, the ones who are able to make it through the pain of growth and failure and to endure success without becoming arrogant are the ones that have a dead parent and have had a paper route or some other significant business in their lifetime. Mm. And my father was killed just before my third birthday which destroyed my home and a lot of my childhood and set me down a path of being abused and having a very difficult life and also drove me to want to escape my home, which drove me to work and self-sufficiency. And as a result, at a very young age, I appreciated the value that I could bring to myself and to protect my brothers and grow with my friends and community through my work ethic. Work ethic. And so when I approach something, it's always, despite my foundations, which were a little more painful, with a lot of optimism and self-confidence and a commitment to executing with excellence, but the humility to know that I can only do my best and that the world doesn't always give you good things is evidenced by how I started and along the way, some of the pain and failure I've endured. Right. How, how, how old were you when you left home? When I left home, you said? Yeah. Oh, I, um, I actually graduated from high school a year early and I left before my, um, I was 17 when I left and have not been back. I graduated from college in three years. And rather than going back, I took a year off and went to DC and worked as a lobbyist before going on to law school. And um, all through college and law school, and even while I was working as a lobbyist, I ran other businesses on the side. So every time somebody thinks they see what it is I'm doing on the surface, they don't know that there's like two or three things I'm doing in parallel behind the scenes, just to be sure I never have to really face utter disaster. Yeah. You know what? I want to circle around that in a second, but the reason I was asking about the age and you mentioned, uh, you know, we, I think, I think no matter how good your home is or how challenging your home is, we all have struggles along the way, but, but in your story specifically, you know, growing up in abusive home, um, wanting to get out that drive, that desire, you know, I moved out of my house when I was 16 uh, up here, 
that's like the le- that's like the legal age that you are allowed to leave. You're not allowed to leave really before that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just it's just that that drive and the desire to be like, I can't be here anymore. I can't keep doing this. I don't want to be here. And then off looking for the other things. The optimism, though, that you've been able to carry through everything that you've done, did, was that learned or is that something that you think is kind of ingrained in you? I think it's it's two parts, because when you grow up with difficulty and especially abuse and on top of it, I, I was Jewish in anti-Semitic Air Force bases all over the South and into parts of the world that did not appreciate Jewish people, didn't appreciate anyone that wasn't white. So I, I would go from abuse to bullying back and forth all the time. So whether I was in my home or out of it, I always felt like somewhat under attack. And a lot of people who grow up that way join the fraternity, in my case, because of male, of violence. And I certainly can appreciate that violence inside of me, but I instilled a discipline of giving myself a timeout whenever I felt things like that rise up. And I also decided that I was not going to be a victim of my past by being held hostage in my future. And the way I decided that was I made a real commitment to kindness and to being with people as opposed to wanting to command people or sublimate people or lock people into their place. And in fact, since I was very young, people referred to me as a Mr. Mom because I have a far more maternal approach to how I interact with uh, people and my friends. I was uh, very engaged with my children. They were part of my life even while I was building all of my businesses. And it's also how I lead. And it's done with a conscious awareness of the importance of kindness. But as I've gotten older, ironically, as I've gone through even harder things, I find that resorting back to the kindness gives me like healing, where if I resort it to the anger, it's something that I would be carrying with me. And I find that I am easily able to stay present by letting go of past pain and not letting it be part of who I am today. How, how do you so, do that? How, because because I've seen, I've seen the very um, understanding, forgiving, easy to work with side of you. I've also seen the side where you know, quite honestly, I kind of pissed you off one day, and uh, you were very uh, direct, and uh, and I appreciate that you were that direct. Uh, and so, but but I and I know your background, you know, as a lawyer and as as an entrepreneur and someone who's very comfortable negotiating things there's this duality to you. Well, you know, the, when I do come across hard and since you had the experience, you can speak to whether or not it's true. I make it a practice not to be hard on the person. And in fact, if I didn't care about you, I wouldn't have taken the time to be hard. And what I do instead or try to do, and again, only you can speak to it in this, this conversation is I try to stay hard on the issue. Right. And why it is that we're having a difficulty and how it is we might be able to solve it. Or perhaps why there's no solution that's going to work and let's just part. We didn't have that conversation. You know, ours was more like, let me let me show you very precisely, not calling you names, not denigrating you in no way doing anything, I hope, than respecting you and caring for you, but saying, let me show you how this looks and what the issues right. are. Right. And I, you can speak to it. Was that your experience oh, or was it different? No, it was, you were, you were very gracious. You were, you were, yeah. So just, just a bit, you know, we were obviously working together on a project. Um, and there was a time where I had thought based on past conversations, we were going one way. You reminded me that, that I was inferring or, um, uh, you know, you felt that I was that I was taking us a direction that, that was not in the best interest of you or the company. And, and really, it was a blind spot. Like I was so caught off guard. Um, I appreciated you sharing me because I it, it immediately started tripping in my mind. Like, where else have I done this? How many other people have I may, maybe unintentionally exposed this to? And and I was more. I was quite honestly just mortified. Like thinking I'm better than this. And and how did how did I allow this mistake to happen? And so, you know, I, I would say two or three times a year as a business owner, you get these really jarring. Uh, um, uh, hard moments, uh, especially when you're working with clients where you're you're like, you're like, Oh, I had another one in September where it was just like, 
completely caught off guard. Uh, great client. I've been working for seven years, built up a ton of trust and, and the team just didn't, I said one thing, I thought I had communicated the team that we were going to do it. It didn't happen. And so all I could do is say, thank you so much for bringing this to me. This is a learning lesson. Like this is this, trust me, I'm learning something from here. Right. Um, but well, that's gracious. <laughs> well, it's nice it that is. it's nice that people like you and these other clients are willing to give us the chance to to get better or to fix. But uh, yeah, I can st- like like if I put myself back into where we were last February when we were having that conversation right here in my office, I, I can I can very painfully remember uh, the correction and and I thank you for that. It was you know part of why I wanted to have you here is um, is is I admire in you your ability to to art to. I don't know if the right words to separate the emotion from it, but you were just speaking to the fact that it's like, it's like, listen, like I'm not attacking you, but, but you know, this is how it's coming across and this is why it's frustrating me. And that like, I don't think I'm good at that. I don't think a lot of us are good at being able to take a step back, remove the emotion from maybe a a challenging situation. And so, uh, and isn't that what's really required in business to be able to move quickly and, and get on with things? Yeah, actually, there's a, a quote, which I'm, I'm not going to get exactly right, by Viktor Frankl, who is a Austrian a psychiatrist who was in the Holocaust, and a lot of people might have read his book. And the essence of the quote is that between a stimulus and the response is a moment of pause where you have an opportunity to decide mm-hmm. how you will respond. And it's mm-hmm. that moment that defines you. <laughs> And to get to that moment and not have a impulse and not to just simply react and to say whatever you felt and to think for a moment, am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I tired? Don't answer. Is this person <laughs> on the other side trying to provoke me? Is, right. you know, that's called the HALT theory, the H-A-L-T, right? Yeah. And the other one is, is the person trying to provoke me and is a fight in my best interest? or is diffusing this situation better for both of us. But just that pause forces you to bring your intellect into your emotion. And it makes sure that the emotions aren't the tail that wags the dog and that it's really your principles and and your presentation and and how you wanna be perceived that dictates what you do next. Hmm. So when I talked about how I handle some of my impulses and I wish I could tell you that I'm angelic and I have no violence and despite my background, I I emerge this very simple, soft, loving, I'm not. I have incredible fury in me and I, I do have violent tendencies and I can get angry easily and I can get depressed just like anyone. Mm. But what I practice is pausing and it's not anything overly dramatic. I don't make a very big deal about it. And it's, it's actually only gotten better over time. I feel like I've mellowed to touch, but I very consciously decide I acknowledge the emotion. I feel it. It's real. I'm not going to pretend I don't have it. I'm not going to sublimate it. In fact, I often call it out. I think with you, I actually said, I think I'm too angry right now to talk. Let us reconvene. And and it's intentional because I realize this is not how I want to communicate. It's not going to do good by either of us. Mm -hmm. And it's in that pause that I didn't deny my emotions, but I didn't allow my my emotions to speak for me. I separated the two. And then when I was able to calmly explain it, I still have the feeling, but the feeling's not dominant, which means that I'm more likely to be successful and helpful in that conversation. I love it. I love it. I got, I got so much. I got so much room to learn in in this one area and to grow in this one area because um, I shoot. Yeah. So I, I tend to be very future focused, and I tend to render out. Like, so if you gave me a challenge right now, I would only need a few seconds to try and think through well, what are the possibilities, what are the intended consequences? How could we go? What are the, you know, how should we move? I think we should do this. And so I've come to trust my ability to react into a situation, but it means that I'm very quick to react to situations as opposed to... Um, the concept of thinking is called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's, it's a, another book I, I, I do learn best by reading. And... Um, What it says is that there is part of us that actually we should know to trust, that we absolutely should know the scenarios where we should think fast and we should react 
And you have to. In life, we have so many inputs that if we paused at every single thing, right. we'd be paralyzed. We're, we're not going to be able to go anywhere. But we're also victims of bias confirm our bias or we resort to comfort and there are conscious things that you can do that take you away from those but they require consciously slowing down and thinking Mm -hmm. and you need to know when to use those two different ways of responding and so when i approach something if you were to watch me through my day it seems pretty much effortless like i just i move i think i do the area where I know that I need to pause is the moment I started to catastrophize or fantasize. Mm. If I am perceiving a future, then I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to be horrible. Or, oh, this is amazing. This is the best thing that could possibly mm. happen. As soon as I've done that, I'm not present. I'm actually staring down the well of despair or staring up into the the ladder of heaven and imagining this amazing thing and have really relinquished the only thing I can control, which is what I do, to either avoid the demise or to ensure the success. And so staying present really matters there. And between thinking fast and slow, that's a moment to slow down, stay present, work with exactly what's in front of you. Don't try to fantasize about a different current state. Don't catastrophize what future demise is going to occur. Hmm. Deal with what's in front of you and execute. You know, and and I'd like to say that I got all this stuff out of my life experiences and I got it out of books and and I've had this like wonderful academic experience, but really my life changed dramatically about five years ago at the, the pit of my very worst despair, depression, and financial um, demise. I did suffer a horrific demise. Yeah. I met tell, the love t- of my t- life. T- t- tell us about Go that. Yeah. What was that? Oh, so I was just saying, tell us about that. Yeah, I, 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 I want to hear this story. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you and I'll take you back. Is that I did meet the love of my life who is a true love because she loved me when I had nothing to give her. But mm. prior to this person, her name is Christy, and she's now my wife. And she's the one who really help me see myself more clearly. Everything I've told you was true beforehand, before I met her. Now it's my truth. Hmm. Before there was more to the story where I would say I'm very good at it, but I have these spikes of wishing I had not behaved the way I did. I matured and mellowed as I grew. Yeah. But just prior to meeting Christy, which is really one of the points in my life where I realized that all of these past pains fortified into a resilient platform that allowed me to survive something I could not have imagined. I had a series of events back to back to back that really were mind numbing painful. One was I almost died of um, losing blood. Then I almost died because I had skin cancer. And then I realized that my, my wife was not in love with me. She finally admitted that she never really was never was going to be, didn't want to work at it, and just loved my doing and loved our family and thought that that would be enough for us. And it was not enough for me. I'd already grown up in an abusive, unloving home, and I had been in a marriage for 20-some years that was not loving in the way I would like to have love. And it just destroyed my world. And I told her I wanted a divorce. I, um, I left and lost everything. I lost every sense of wanting to live. I lost my sense of family. And um, I ended up, unfortunately, in the arms of someone that is a, I now know to be a borderline, that defrauded me, perjured, um, forged (laughs) my signature, took my assets, all the things that anyone who knew me would never know could happen to me because I'm too smart for that to happen. Right. But no, that was not the case. I was not that smart. I was not that aware. I was not that emotionally strong. And I hit rock bottom and found a way to go below rock bottom. And it was the most depressing part of my life. And it was um, one of two times in my life I actually contemplated suicide. And in the week I was done, I was actually going to do it. Christy, my wife now, walked into a coffee shop that I had started because I wanted to have the best coffee in the world. And that was my only success in that period just prior to meeting her as it became top 25 in America. And I was like, all right, I remember I can still achieve great things. The silly coffee shop became my great achievement. But this was the week I was done. And then Christy walked in 
And the two of us saw in each other something that we both had been missing because she unfortunately had a life pretty similar to what I described as mine and was very unhappy. And we saw in each other what we both knew we were really about as opposed to what our past might have suggested. And it became the greatest part of my life to the point where sitting here today, I would repeat my entire life up to the moment she walked in with just this for mindset, the opportunity, just for the opportunity, just to be here talking to you today. So, <laughs> what 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 year was um, when when you know you ran into the health issues? When your life is at risk? When your wife is telling you that I don't love you and I've never loved you and everything's falling apart? What year was that? 2009 um, and 2010. It was all yeah, 2009 was a great year for, for everyone, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. what, right what on the hills of 2008. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, and the reason I asked that is uh, like, like how, how old were you, if you don't mind me asking? I, um, I'm 53 now. And at the time I was um, 42. 42. So you no, just... 40, 40, um, 42. Yeah, it's 42. So you put a you good, would think I don't math quicker than that. <laughs> you put a good two decades, as you mentioned, into building, building the, uh, the wealth, building uh, the family, building the life, uh, building, you know, the, the self, uh, the, the identity of the person who can achieve and can succeed and everything else. So you're 42. So you're five years actually older than I am right now. And I still feel like I've completely been wasting my time and I'm way behind and all of these things. But the reason I'm curious about this is because uh, you've read Ray Dalio's book, Principles? I'm sorry? Have you read Ray Dalio's book, Principles? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. Sorry. Are you familiar with Ray Dalio, the, uh, the, the investor? Uh, the guy I who- assume not. <laughs> okay. So he runs uh, Bridgewater Capital, I think it's called, but uh, a massive company that, um, anyway, he built his whole organization off of these principles that, that he baked into the company. But when I was reading his book, what I was most inspired by was he was like the whiz kid through the 70s and early 80s. And then he made a bunch of big mistakes and it took him 10 years to build back what he had lost. Um, and, and so every time that I feel that sense of like anxiety of like, maybe I'm late, maybe I'm wasting my time. What's the last few years been How, like, what should I do? And, oh my goodness, I'm facing 40 and all of these things. Um, what's it like to be 42 and to lose that stuff and then to have a whole bunch of years of hardship as well, knowing now that you're on the other side of it and that things are better. But, but I mean, that's also midlife. I mean, that's, that's a precarious. Yeah, principle. actually, um, I was accused of having a midlife crisis in the I way all of this unfolded. And I, I did have the fortitude to go see a psychiatrist and she goes, no, you are having a crisis and you are in your midlife. But this is no midlife crisis. Like these are real events that were really happening. And at the time that this happened, I really was at the pinnacle of success. We were in the newspaper for being the, the chairs of charities. I was running huge companies with lots of people. I was doing turnaround work on behalf of Fortune 500 companies. And our wealth was ridiculous. It was just dynastic wealth. It was silly. And I am this. I was this then. I mean, just I, I didn't need be humble. This was just who I was. But if you saw my life from the outside looking in, you would think I was faking it because there's no way I, I lived where I lived the way I lived. And I did lose everything. And I, when I say I lost everything, I really lost nothing. Now, at the time, it didn't feel like that. You know, you lose all your money, you lose your home, you lose your cars, you lose your credit, you lose your respect, uh, family members, uh, every one of my family members, other than my two children, turn their back on me, like everybody left me. And all the friends I had helped and all the charities turned their back on me, everybody. So, so what, and what was it? Go ahead. So, so you, you, you weren't doing it without a purpose. What was it? that you wanted that made it worth losing all of that for? Well, the reason I had left and what I was seeking was to fill the emptiness that I felt from childhood and through my marriage. There was a, uh, my mother had actually told me to my face that she had never loved me. I had a wife who said the same thing to me and I ended up in the arms of someone who loved my wealth and that's why she was with me. So I hit the trifecta of not getting the one thing I really cared about. And 
prior to Christy walking in, I had really determined this life was just not what I thought life was supposed to be because I never really cared about the achievement or the wealth or the success or the things that seemed to motivate everybody else to take points of pride or just to take, right? And, and the takers never stop. It's up to the giver to say no because they're never going to. But right. I had sought something that up until that very fateful moment where Christy had walked into Addiction Coffee House, which was my coffee house, I never had. And at the end of that, just prior to that, I realized that nothing in life was worth more than what I really saw, which was that mutual love. Mm -hmm. And now that I have it, and I do, for real, this is one where I don't have to analyze, so I, I have it, <laughs> the rest was easy. I mean, what really surprised me is once I met Christy, it was a hard climb because I'm, I'm climbing from below zero. I mean, so I, I was working from a point where I was below zero. And then out of that came back within less than five years to a lifestyle comparable to where I was before. Hmm. And back on me are all now trying to reconnect with me because they're like, oh, wait a second you're back to the same status and capability that you had before. And my answer, not to them, because I won't speak with them again, but my answer, if I were to speak to them again, is I had made four major successes. What made you think I couldn't do it again? And separate right. from that, I had lived a life where I was earning more than most people would earn as a success. I was earning that a year. And it was just like, what? You didn't think I could do that? All I had to do was live and be motivated again, and I could do it over. So back to the story around principles, I, would, I don't know what the book is or what its principles are, but my starting principle foundation is be happy, execute fully, and you will achieve your greatest success to the extent the world allows you to. But if you're capable, you're always capable, and you only grow. So being at the bottom, yes, I was at the moment of, Done. But since I didn't take that path and, and the flow and the universal energies said, no, we have something better for you. you you've reached your, your rock bottom. Here's Christy. Now you can go live a different life. As soon as I saw the upswing, like, oh, my God, I, I don't have to stop here. Right. The rest came easy. Losing it right. doesn't scare me. <laughs> Losing it doesn't scare you now. Did it Did it scare you before? Was, was No, you... actually, I think I actually wished it away. I really do. I, I wasn't at my end because of what I lost. I was at my end because of what I didn't have. And it wasn't what I lost that I didn't have. It's what I got that I was looking for. That's amazing. That's 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 such an, an amazing story. And, and so was there, you know, so you meet Christy and you're at rock bottom and you got to rebuild. What was... What was the rebuild process? Because you're running the it coffee was shop. Very like humbling. It was really very humbling. Um, when I met Christy, I, I had not a bank account, no credit card, no car, no home. <laughs> I was at a really bad place. You had a coffee and, shop. Um, how, did you, how did you get a lease? <laughs> I, I didn't. I couldn't. I, I literally had zero financial ability. I used to be able to walk into a bank and ask for a multi-million dollar loan. And on the spot, they would give it to me because of my credit and what I had done. And I couldn't even get a credit card. And I couldn't get a job. I have one friend. His name is Tony Boswell. He and I were lawyers together. And we've been friends now for 26 years. Who was one of the only people, there were about six people who really stayed with me and he was one of them. And he was willing to do anything I needed for help. But I said, no, no, I, I wanna earn it. And he was at the Boys and Girls Club in Delaware. He's the executive director or executive VP there. And he didn't have a job and there was nothing that I could do. So he gave a job to Christy. And for me, he let me go take pictures. I, I'm a photographer. I started my first business at eight and I picked up my camera at eight. So the way I came back was taking pictures of kids at the Boys and Girls Club and of events at the Boys and Girls Club and then at another charity, then of people's pets and then of some friends, do um, dogs and kids and family photos. And I just started earning enough 
to finally get my feet underneath me. And then I got a real consulting engagement. And it just very incrementally, I mean, really, uh, it was very humbling, like incredibly humbling, because I'm like, I could run the Boys and Girls Club. And instead, right. I'm sitting here in a field taking pictures. Yeah, it's just like, it was, it was awesome, because I love photography. And it was also like, I can do more than this. Like you said, I'm better than this. Right. I can do better. Yeah. But it was really because Christy thought so much of me that I was willing to work that hard for us. And my friend believed in me enough to like find a way to get me enough to get started that I grew from there. I mean, bit by bit into now I've been since that total demise in the day I met Christy, I'm now at the head of four different companies. And in fact, um, Last November, the company you helped us with, we had to put it on pause because of COVID-related supply issues. And that very same week, I started a new company called Jukestrat, which is screaming, doing beautifully with you know all kinds of great clients. And it's just a, a very resilient, next, let's go. I love it. I love it so much. Uh, if... <laughs> Now that you're in a healthier place and you know you guys have just relocated to a new home and a new community and all of these amazing things, um, it sounds like your wife was your savior, but but it did form an, like a different version of a codependent, unhealthy relationship? Or how have you been able to manage this fact that, that she has brought to you what you need and she fills this amazing role, but, but you guys are still... Uh, it's not unhealthy in any way, if you know what I'm asking. No, I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, our lives are intertwined the way I wanted to. My former wife used to tease that I married you for good and, well, for good, but not for lunch. <laughs> Whatever they say is the thing, but really, but not for lunch. Like she didn't want to spend time and, and I do want time. And so Christy and I have coffee time and cooking and cocktails and we have a hot tub and we have like happy hour in the hot tub and like we're always together and and in fact we work in our different companies together and we adore that time together but we also have made it clear that we have real differences like i start my morning by writing morning pages and i do walks by myself and there are certain venture or parts of our businesses that I do independently. And we have aspects of each of us. And she has her whole list of things that she does separately. And we have deep respect for one another as far as what each of our strengths and weaknesses are. And we look to build, but I would say that our souls are codependent in the way people talk about a soulmate. Mm. And our lives are intertwined but we are able to rise with our own capabilities, knowing the other person supports us, but we can't make the other person do it, nor do we try. We just give the strength. And I, my, my statement to her and hers to me is, I am behind you, I am next to you, I will lead. Let me know what you need, but you have to do the part in between. I can't do that. Oh, I love that. Ex explain more, what does that mean? It means that if I say to Christy, look, you are, you're stronger than this. You're better than this. Go do that. Hmm. <laughs> I'm saying it. Not very motivating. It make her do that, right? <laughs> right. And, and just my observation doesn't make her know and believe that. So right. all I can do is support her willingness to have the courage to try something. But I can't make it easier for her. I can't do it for her. And I can't take the lesson from the exercise for her and vice versa. Hmm. So being supportive of someone is you allow them to fail. You allow them to try. You don't judge them. You don't say, you know, oh, you could have done better than that. Like, that's horrible. <laughs> what it really is, is like, try again. It's okay. It, you, you failed. It's not a problem. I don't think less of you. I think more of you go do it again. And when you allow for that level of independence, lovingly, non-judgmentally supportive independence, I find that you don't have that codependence that I think people are generally talking about. But when I talk about soul codependence, I don't yeah. think I would survive her, her demise. And I don't think she would survive my demise. Our yeah. souls are going to follow each other. Yeah, I always, I always talk about this. There's this feeling that I know that I hit when something's feeding your soul. And you can have it 
you know, with food, you can have it with friends or great conversation. You can have it with work when you feel like you're accomplishing something. Yes, yeah, I know what like, you mean. It's like, it's like, it's just, this is feeding my soul right now. Yes. And, um, and, and I think that's what you're talking about in terms of just like the togetherness, the, the, the sharing of life, all of those things just feeds a part of you that, that you've been waiting your whole life to have filled. It sounds. It's funny. I, I'm I'm five five. I am not a big person at all. I feel huge, and <laughs> it's not like one of these grandeur things. It's not one of these um, little big man things at all. And it's not what I'm talking about. I feel so full of joy. I feel so lucky to have had the life I've had, to become who I am, to be here now, and to say that I'm acknowledging. That sucked. It was awful. Right. Right, right, right. This was so painful. And at the time, I couldn't see the why. I couldn't see the why. And I think the part I'm, I'm most proud of the younger me is that I pushed through, not on faith, but just through tenacity. In fact, I'm called Tenacious D by most of my friends. Just tenacity because it can't be worse than this. <laughs> You know, and I'm going to just keep pushing through. And sitting here today, I feel that my soul has been fed a, a total gourmet meal of life. Like, it's amazing I what it, it feels like now. And how infectious. Like, I, I, don't, I, I never met the version of you pre-2009. But, you know, you're an infection, infectious person to be around now. Was is, is this because of the new lease on life and the, and the, and the love and the purpose and everything else. Like, obviously there's non, there's monetary benefits to being able to rebuild, but are, are you, no. are, are you different to be around or literally this 15 years ago, this would have still been you just in a suit, in a box, in a cage. Well, I wasn't wearing a suit. Uh, okay. but <laughs> if you knew me as a leader of a company outside of my family, you would have felt a lot of the exact same things. In fact, my my approach of going through life has always been with and through people. And I do turnarounds that way. I build companies that way. And in fact, I build businesses around what I refer to as the bad news bears, the people that don't have the most stellar resumes, but are the most beautiful humans with real capabilities and earnest, passionate heart. Mm -hmm. And in those organizations, you would feel my energy. And it, I always had this. In fact, if I didn't have it, I wouldn't be here to talk to you now. What you would have noticed different would have been that I was posing a bit more in my personal happiness. My greatest joy were my children, but I was not happy with my marriage. I was not happy with my family members. I wasn't happy with the superficiality of most of our friends set, you know, and I put that in quotes, the, the community. Mm -hmm. I, I hate it, my synagogue, but I put on a nice face and I was right. posing through a huge part of my life. Right. Why? Because it was expected that given my station and where I was, that I should be happy. And, right. and I felt like I should be happy. And it was almost like a guilty obsession to recognize that I was not happy. Like, how could I not be? From everybody else's superficial perspective, I have this beautiful family, I had this beautiful home, I had these magnificent businesses, I was successful. You should be happy. You know, how, how dare you not be happy? And, and uh, I just always felt like you're missing the mark. Those things are worldly material things other than my children. All the rest of that is just trappings. And trapping it has a real meaning. It doesn't just mean like what it represented. It traps you into this belief that this was meant to be a measure of happiness. And it's not for me. And in fact, when I look back at each time I achieved things that were remarkable at the time and like younger than anybody or the highest level or the greatest grade, whatever it happened to be, you know, business that I sold to a public company, it was flashing a pan. Yeah, that was amazing. Oh my God, I'm still me. I'm still in this life. <laughs> like, right. This isn't happy. This is not happy because for me, you know, happiness and happiness comes through meaning and purpose. And for me, the meaning and purpose is love. And it's like feeling a connection, but real connection, not just being part of a community or having some trappings. Mm -hmm. 
I love that. Like you've, you've literally left me speechless. Usually I have an next question in mind, but I was just so engrossed with what you were saying that, that I'm like, I'm not even thinking about the next thing. <laughs> I'm just All like, right. this is, this is, yeah, this is amazing. And so at your current age, right, you're, you're in your fifties, uh, God willing, you know, you have another 40, 50, maybe a hundred years ahead of you if technology can keep us. I think, going I, have, this way. I, think I have 46, well, 46. <laughs> Let's not be too specific with it, but, <laughs> but, but you have, you have, uh, again, I, I always say God willing, because we just don't know, but hopefully you have, you have no a idea. lot of time ahead of you. And, uh, now that you have built it, and walked away from it more than lost it, but walked away from it and then lost it and then had nothing and then rebuild. Um, how many more of these cycles do you have within you? Or is it just now that you've done it, you're like, I can survive pretty much anything. So I know that life is going to throw a whole bunch of bad things at me and you're not worried. Or is there this like feeling like, like the first time cost you a lot. And do you have the, like, if, if my wife were to tell me we're having more kids right now, I would have the reaction of like, oh, do I have this in me? And then of course I'd be happy, but mostly right. like, oh, wow. How many more failures, how many more setbacks, how many more teardowns do you have in you? I, I actually believe I have infinity in me. I do. I, um, the, the, the one I had just gone through was not my only one that was difficult. I had some really bad ones that prior to this were bad in their own rights, you know, and, and, and I've also had the successes too. And all of those were easier for me to say, what an excellent experience, fascinating. I've never been through that before. This last one was just more excruciating and devastating and my personal failures affected other people. So this is, it's not something I'm proud of in any way. I mean, this caused a lot of pain. Going forward, I, I already had a company and you were, I've had three companies actually sit in these five years that did not work and didn't work at a level that didn't devastate me, but they were my focus and they were my path to profit. And all three didn't work. And this is within five years. So I, I don't see me stopping. In fact, I think retiring is like waiting to die. Right. And if my alternative is money in the bank and I could retire versus go run out more businesses and go try new ventures and go really push that edge of the envelope, definitely choosing the second over the former until the last second I can. And it has nothing to do with wealth. It has nothing to do with bragging rights. It has everything to do with being engaged in life with people constantly. Hmm. And I love growing and leading teams. And I love making a difference. And I don't want to do it by writing checks. I don't want to do it by pontificating. I want to be a doer. In fact, I don't watch TV. I don't watch sports. I am in no way a spectator. I don't want to retire to the couch. I want to stay at the forefront and continue to make things happen. And by making that decision, it would be naive. And for me, just utter ignorance to think I'm not going to fail again. I will. I know it. I'm walking in, I am going to choose something. If it can be done, I believe I can do it. But if the universe says no, spank. And then I'll stand up, brush myself off and just go next. And I'll literally start a company the next day. But I, like, I know, I know a lot of what you do is not only, um, you know, uh, being able to ensure that the company has a proper footing and, and has market fit and makes sense and all the things that, that go into it. But, but you also go out and you raise capital. You also yes. go out and you take your name, your experience, the opportunity, you put your name on it and you go out to people and say, give me a check, trust me. And so uh, I, like, I find it very, very hard to, um, if, if I have an inkling of doubt in something, I will not fully commit to it in the way that I need to convince someone like, or not even convince them, but just bring my full passion to this will work. Trust me. It's, it's going to work um, because I don't want to be a liar later. I don't want to, right. I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to say, you know, and so you end up couching things, but then you can't, 
no one wants to buy into someone who's couching things. They want to buy into someone who's pop your bubble. I'm going to pop your bubble here in a second. Okay. Which is so, so, so how the question I was going to ask is, is how do you not mitigate risk, but how do you manage and not even ego? I know you have no ego. How do you just manage your reputation knowing that, that, that there are things that could tear you down, I guess is what I'm asking. I actually lead with my weaknesses I outlined the risk, and I am very clear that this can and might fail. I never sell. I never sell. I do not believe in telling people why they should invest. I express to them that I have dedicated myself to a venture, that this venture is designed to do the following. We anticipate that this, if it were to work, can accomplish the following goals and social impact. Both are important to me. And mission is the following. And here are all the reasons I'm going to fail. And let me outline them for you. And um, when I do raise money, I have a private placement document. And the thickest part are the risk factors. Mm -hmm. And they're not just like some boilerplate. I really go to town. I didn't predict. So I missed that one. But even though I didn't predict COVID, I did predict that supply chains could change and our cost to manufacture could go through the roof, which is what happened with pedal. And so when I when I engage someone, I tell them I don't need your money. I do need money to do this. Your money. If you want to invest, you need to know you can lose it. You will likely lose it. And that you understood that I'm not coming to you and guaranteeing you a win because I can't. All I can guarantee is I will be 100% devoted to this. I have a clear visibility on what my risk factors are. I intend to mitigate them the best I can. And I will execute with excellence every single day on your behalf and ours, our homes. And if that's enough for you, you can buy, but I will not sell. So I'm only facilitating a buy and I'm facilitating a buy by putting all the poop on the table. Right. There it is. Do you want it? Right. And so really, uh, I, 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 so really what you're buying, what they're buying into is obviously, um, intentions, uh, commitment and the ability to adapt and work as hard as possible. And one other thing, I didn't varnish the truth. Mm. I gave them the good. I gave them the bad and I concentrated on the ugly. And they understand that I'm not walking in. And and I've been doing this since my very first time I raised money. This is something I don't know how I knew. In fact, I often feel like there must be a voice over here that's whispering. Maybe it's my dead dad saying, tell him this. I'm like, really? I should tell him this awful thing? Let me tell you this awful thing because I want you to know that I see this awful thing. It's it's really, truly possible. And I... I've encountered some of those awful things and I have failed for the reasons I said, if this happens and I can't accomplish this by then, it's going down and people still invest it. And, you know, most people who, well, most people, no one wants to lose money, Mm. but the reason they're sophisticated investors and I generally do a good job of finding those is because they understand that loss is probable risk is the reason you get a reward. You don't just get your money in a return because you believe in me or you believe in my story. So I'm not passionate about the underlying business. And in fact, if you look at my resume, I've never done the same thing twice, not once. Even if you factor in all my consulting and all my turnaround work, not once is it the same. Hmm. So I'm not, I'm not articulating expertise in anything other the conviction, execution, and clear-eyed perspective that I will go to mitigate as I attempt to grow it. And then people buy in. And the other thing is, you would think after I had my tenure, you know, the, the demise I described, no one would want to invest in me anymore. Right. And I, I worried that they would never want to. And then I realized I was the only one doing that to myself because most entrepreneurs have some real scars and not small ones. You know, you, if you really are someone who has done this well, and I'm not talking about the people like the PayPal mafia, you know, who happened to hit it really big and then were able to go out and keep hitting it big because now they've been dubbed a winner. 
right. mean the people who really start at the bottom and like getting beat up a few times, they all have a scar or more than one that are really significant. So once I accepted that, which I did for myself, but I, I projected to the world, they might see me differently. Once I got over that attitude, which didn't take me very long, <laughs> I just said, look, I'm no different. I can see and appreciate risk better than before because I've never taken such big hits. And so I just articulate it and I share my whole truth. Here's who I am, good, bad, and ugly. Here's this venture, good, bad, and ugly. And I'm not going to a Rolodex and I'm not going to friends and family. I don't know the people who invest for the most part. They're new. That's and they're people who I target because they'd have an interest in what I'm doing in that instance. That's amazing. What, so, so at this point in your life, you know, having the experience, um, having the ability and, and the time to work through the books, to work through your journals, to, 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 with maturity and with age and time, you know, you start to put yourself first more and you start to do all of those things at this point, then what are the things that still scare you? What are the things that give you pause? I should say, because you won't allow, you know, you'll take that moment for pause. So, so what are those things? I think what worries me most is that I won't have the next opportunity. I've always been kind of amazed that my life has flowed good and bad, but it flows where I now, at least in hindsight, can see the connections and can understand how fortunate I was to meet someone at a certain point because it came to play later. And I think I torture myself occasionally with this belief that I had this hiatus before meeting Christy. This, these five years, there were five before and five since, that the five before so devastated my ability to network and maneuver and it severed, you know, so many people that I've been worried that I'm not going to get the next opportunity to demonstrate what I can do or to, to build something from there. But if I step back and I speak to myself, so if I were my own, you know, I were the father to myself and, and look down at myself, I say, just calm because look at what's happened in such a tight time frame. And none of that was of your manufacturing. That's the world that came to you. You just put yourself in the world. And so my answer always is just have the courage to be in the world. And so Fossaker, the new company we started in the same week that we put Pedal on pause. The reason I did it is that um, Jim Estel of Danby, who was our manufacturing partner for Pedal, the one who delivered the bad news to us on Friday the 13th in November, <laughs> asked if I would help him. And I was just, it just struck me like, see, there it is. That's your connection. And he became the first client of Fosker, I'm sorry, of Jukestrat. And, um, and the reason I, I, I pause and think about that is because I would have never imagined that's how it would have happened. Right. And since I couldn't imagine it, why am I wasting time fearing it? It goes exactly to what I told you about. I'm catastrophizing my future. Yeah. I need to just stay present. And so to answer your question, that is the thing that haunts me, but it, I've gotten better and better and better at just not ignoring it. I, I've acknowledged it, but not letting it dominate my thoughts and staying present and knowing this conversation could lead to something. Someone could see this and it leads to something. The work I'm doing has already led to stuff I did not anticipate. And it's just let that anxiety go. You know, or acknowledge it and don't let it drive you. I love it so much. You mentioned something just now about if I were to talk to myself, playing the father role, talking to my son, is that something you do a lot? A little bit. I, I think since my father was killed and um, my mother was not maternal and her husband, her second husband was not a, a, a good figure. I've always had that missing and I've always played the role of big brother or father to others. And it's something that I, prior to uh, divorcing my first wife, I struggled with, it was like a void because I didn't have the parental figure. Yeah. And in that five years, it was like turmoil for me. It was just like, no one was telling me where to go. There was no one left to tell me where to go. 
or what to do, or I didn't have any of that kind of mentoring. But in these five cents, it's become more of a sort of a calm appreciation of me pausing to see myself and saying, you're doing okay. Uh, in terms which I'm actually going to probably blush to say, I, I didn't love myself prior to meeting Christy, which really goes also to why we're not codependent in the way you might imagine. I actually love myself for the first time um, in, in these five years and, and actually have admired how I've come through it and in no way disaggregating the pain I caused or the upset from before or the great accomplishments from before. But I just see this as a demarcation where finally I realized that the love I was looking for isn't just the love that Christine, I'm pointing because she's in the back room behind me, it's not just the love that she gave to me. And I, I thank her for loving me, is I actually love myself for the very first time. And in a way that seems extremely healthy, you know, just yeah. I appreciate it. And it's not like I look at myself and say, oh, you're so handsome and you're so great. You do all these things. The opposite. It's like, you're real. You're, you're, you're a real person. You struggle with real issues. And I, I don't talk to myself in the third person, but I, I have that third party narrative of pausing. And, and I think morning pages have helped me with that too, of really pausing in the day and just saying, why are you practicing this cognitive dissonance of thinking something you did was stupid? How is it possible you're stupid when these other things were kind of smart? So you're not. Yeah. And it's okay to make a mistake and, and be happy with yourself. Oh, that's so interesting. Because so something that I've been really struggling with over the last year, being home a lot more, of course, and all of these things is my kids are growing up. And, and um, you know, my oldest is 14. My next is 12. I have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. And um, they're hitting the age now where I realized this year that they're not only watching, but in 10 or 15 or 20 years, the way that I act, they will remember. When, when they say my childhood was, it's getting baked in now. And when they're five, the and six and seven, yeah. And, and that not only that responsibility, but it's, it's kind of terrifying me. Um, but I did not, I, I don't, I don't really have a close relationship with my dad. You know, like my, like if I call my dad right now, we can jump on a call, but mostly it's like every two or three months we talk for like a minute and a half or two minutes. Um, and so we just never had that close relationship. And so part of what I'm learning from my son right now is actually like how to be the dad that he needs, but also I've just somehow convinced myself that when they get older, they won't need me anymore. Because when I get older, I moved out at 16. I just didn't, I just didn't need my dad that way. Uh, my mom and I have a closer relationship, but it's still, we're just very independent people. And so when you said that thing about, <laughs> about taking a step back and, and talking, you know, if I were to talk to myself and look at myself the way that I look at my kids with the love that I have and the grace that I have um, and, and all of the time they have in front of them and everything, I don't know if I... I've never run that exercise off in my mind, but um, I don't know what I would say to myself, but it, it seems like a really powerful thing to, to, to try at least. I think that when you do it, because knowing you, I know you're now going to go try. I, will. I, I would say don't try to fixate only on what's good because you will hear an inauthentic voice, even though it's your own. Yeah. yeah say, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, and if you approach yourself, but aware way, you know, and say, yeah, that was disappointing. You can do better than that. Or that's not your, your best side. You can do better than that. Or that was really sweet of you. You didn't have to do that, you know, kind of thing where you realize that there is a good and a bad and an ugly in all of us. And it doesn't mean that you're unworthy. It just means you have room for improvement. And <laughs> it's, it's just being fair to yourself in the same way you are to your kids. I, you have four kids and they're each different in their own ways. I haven't met them, but I just know how kids are and you love each of them in a different way. And so it's really an exercise in loving yourself from where you are in the same way you love each of your kids from where they are. And I'll tell you something, since you shared what you said about your parents, my son is 27 years old and he talks to me like three times a day, every day. And my daughter had a very difficult time with 
uh, what had happened around her mother and what happened to me and my demise um, and just recently came back to me in the last year. But in this last year has been in two of my companies. So we talk every day now. And when she was born, I used to say, I don't know why people want father and son. She's the one I want to be in business with. I'll follow her one day. And so it's been amazing to actually have my daughter in the business with me. And she is everything I thought she would be. And my son is like this big hearted human. And my, my daughter is just a great human too, but a really good leader and a really good business person. And it's just been amazing. And if I allowed my past to be my perspective of my future, I wouldn't have stayed present to do what I needed to do to be sure I wasn't held hostage to what's in my rear view mirror. And now I have my kids in the front row driving with me and it's a pretty amazing place. It was another one of my favorite conversations. Okay, key takeaways for me. Number one, if you make yourself a victim of the pain from your past, you're gonna actually trap yourself in that victimhood. You will become a prisoner in the future. Number two, acknowledge an emotional reaction, but don't allow your emotion to speak for you. David is so, so good at this. Bring intellect to the emotion. And number three, if you've hit rock bottom and maybe even lower than rock bottom, like David, you can search for meaning. You can rise above the current situation. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world, we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold. And then you, you just have to say yes. If you're ready for more inspiration, you have got to hear the story of how this man went from being homeless to being a multimillionaire, and it was not easy. Click on the link right over there. I think habits are inherent, but choices are chosen. I did have to make the initial choice, which was the, yes, I'm going to do this. But I did regress several times.